Okay, hello everyone. Um, thanks very much for being here for this presentation on LARP and culture. A few provisos before I kind of get into it. I probably should have called the presentation culture and LARP rather than LARP and culture because culture actually probably plays a bigger part in what I'm going to try and talk about. So if you feel that I've misrepresented the presentation fundamentally in my choice of title, I totally won't hold it against you if you decide to leave at this point. <laughs> I should also say that um, I consider myself to be uh, quite a newcomer to the LARP scene. Uh, I had my introdu introduction to LARP in 2015 and Sol Makota last year was my first KP. Um, so I'm kind of talking more from the background as somebody who's been a theatre maker uh, and only more recently somebody who's involved in LARP. Um, uh, also, apologies for the fact that, the, the, as you can see, the, the slides that I have here are really kind of granular and grainy. Um, it's the first time I'm using a, a PowerPoint presentation, so that's exciting. <laughs> but also, it has its technical limitations, as you can see. Although, I, I kind of, I pers on a personal level, I really like the kind of 90s, early internet aesthetic <laughs> of this slide. Uh, so the, the theme of the, the presentation is LARP and culture, and uh, it seems appropriate to start off by talking about the question, what is culture, or what do we understand culture to, to be? Um, so I'm going to use a, a, a simple definition, uh, which is that culture is really just the accumulated values or standards or practices that groups of people choose to ascribe to and choose to live their life according to. So we'll look at one simple example as a way in. Now this image you know, shows the use of a, quite a big saw. Uh, that's not what I'm kind of referring to in this picture. It's more that I'm referring to an image from a wedding. Uh, so a wedding's for me kind of a useful example of, of culture. Um, in many places around the world, many people choose to uh, engage in the cultural ritual of marriage. Um, whether that's to affirm the love that two people have for each other in some cultures, whether that's to, from, perhaps from a governmental perspective, to kind of create stable family units for children to be brought up and become um, functioning members of society, but also from, in some cultures, uh, a religious sacrament, a religious ritual that affirms um, various aspects of religious faith. So there are many different ways that marriage can work, but as an example of culture, I think it's a good one. Many people around the world simply decide, either through education or through their own choice, that marriage is a, a, an example of a, of a cultural value, something that is valued that they want to ascribe to. In showing this, I'm not in any way advocating marriage. If some of you are married, then that's really great. I, I'm not myself, but you know, um, so there's no value judgment on marriage, but it's just a useful example of um, a cultural practice that affirms a value, something that's considered to be valuable. But there are lots of other examples, so we'll move to this one. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're LARPers and we talk about games, we talk about play, um, and many play activities um, function directly or indirectly as ways to reaffirm cultural value. So this is an image from the New Zealand rugby team, the All Blacks. This is a ritual that they perform before international matches. It's called the Haka, and it's a traditional war dance of the Maori people in what's now known as New Zealand. And the fact that it's a war dance is significant because it, it precedes the, the conduct of a rugby match, which you know, could well be seen as a metaphor for some type of warlike conflict. So as, a, as an expression of cultural values, if rugby is seen to be about territorial conquest and the use of physical force, this is a cultural practice links quite well. Now, New Zealand um, isn't a particularly war, warlike country. It's a small country and they, they, they're, they're not well known for, for being warlike. Traditionally, the Maori people who uh, are the indigenous people in New Zealand perhaps were more warlike, but actually, the fact that there's a war dance and a warlike game could be argued to be more expressive of the country that invented rugby, and that's England. And if we know anything about the history of England and the British Empire, they were pretty good at, at uh, a territorial conquest. Um, the British Empire spread widely around the world, including to New Zealand, and that's why New Zealand is one of the countries that plays rugby. So we think about rugby as a game, as a play activity, 
The nature of the game and where it went to is a strong expression of cultural values, in this case of the British Empire. But we can look at lots of other cultural practices that express values. So looking at early forms of art here, we have some cave paintings. So we have some animals depicted and we have some people with bows and spears. Now, you know, I'm, I'm in no position to kind of give an expert rendering or reading of what these cave paintings mean. I'm not an art historian. But, you know, I think you can construct the argument that for the people who produced this work, it's affirming something that was considered to be valuable. The ability to hunt effectively in this culture was considered an important cultural value, and that's perhaps why they chose to make this depiction of their own particular culture, to use the spear, to use the, the bow and arrow in order to feed your people. And then we come to words, language. So we've talked about play as a, a cultural practice. We've talked about, um, we talked about the use of images uh, as a cultural practice that affirms cultural values. Words do the same thing and storytelling does the same thing. So here we've got some text from uh, one of the, you know, the early forms of uh, what might be kind of now called the novel. We're, we're looking at text from one of the Icelandic family sagas. So there's two forms of activity going on here. There's the written word, which in some way gives a representation of the world that perhaps affirms the value of family continuity, perhaps, in the Icelandic sagas, but also the value of storytelling. And if you think about storytelling in its most elemental sense, whether it's parents, whether it's elders in a community, the use of stories, in the same way that the use of images or the use of play, can be seen as a way of reaffirming the things which this group of people hold to be valuable. And I've touched on the word representation and I think representation is a useful thing to think about in any form of art but also in, in LARP. I would argue that in, in LARPs either by intention or by accident we're offering some type of representation of the world, of our view of the world. As designers and as players we represent the experience that we've had of the world in the fiction that, that we create and this can be found in all sorts of forms of play so a very very ancient game like backgammon again could be seen as a representation of the world uh, uh, of a world the the play objects here represent something they're quite abstract but you know it's easy to make the argument in looking at traditional games like backgammon and senate that are about journeys that again we're kind of we're in the territory of looking at territorial control and conquest backgammon's a game about controlling territory so it could be seen that this form of representation the abstract objects the play objects are representative tools that show what, what's considered to be valuable by the people who, who make and play this game. Similarly, we have things like this. So in, in ancient Greek culture, the use of representational, more, more, more naturalistic or realistic representational objects in the form of sculpt, sculpture represent the world and perhaps represent a cultural value of the world. So in this case, the statue of David um, you know, could be argued to be the depiction of man in his ideal form. Man is an ideal of beauty. So again, in the same way that abstract objects provide a representation of the world, a more concrete, um, mimetic representation of the world perhaps shows something that's considered to be valuable culturally. And as I mentioned, words. Words are, are probably one of the primary tools that we use to represent the world. So this neat little diagram, I don't want to go too, too far into this detail, but we're talking about signification. So in the world we have things uh, which are these. It's a bit of a scribbly thing, but if you look out the window you can see a bunch of them. They look a bit different, but trees. So there are objects in the world that we now call tree. But the process of calling them tree in English is actually a complex process. We've got this thing, this set of scribbles on a page that represent this object. We've got a word, tree, that represents this thing. And the combination of the thing which is signified, the thing out there, the combination of the signifier, this, and also the word tree, produces the sign. So the sign is the, is the representational combination of the thing in the world what we speak to represent it and what we write to represent it. And we take this for granted. We, we, you know, lang language is something that's, that, that we feel just naturally occurs, but actually it's something that we're actively constructing all the time. 
So in the same way that LARP designers aspire to be conscious about how they represent the world in their designs, we can also apply that consciousness to the other forms of representation that we use. How do we use language to represent our world? How do we use images? How do we use abstract symbols? And then in cultural forms, we have ways that these things combine. So this is a, an image from what looks like probably quite a bad production of a Greek play. But, um, but you know, I, I, I didn't say it. I'm in no position to judge. But this is a combination of images. So we have visual depictions of something. Um, we can also probably suppose that there's also the use of spoken words, which have probably come from the text that a writer has given to this performer. So in these forms of art, similar to LARP, where we're able to combine scenography, abstract and concrete visual representations of the world, and the use of written and spoken words to represent our experience, we're drawing on all of these forms of representation to give expression to our cultural values, whether we're conscious of that or not. So my argument here as a, as a kind of a foundational thing is that these forms of representation are, are all important tools for how we as designers and players choose to represent cultural values. Now, representation um, is something that I would say is inextricably linked to questions of power. You can argue quite strongly in, a, in many ways that those who are powerful in the world determine the forms of representation that we're allowed to use. Languages get banned, books get banned, images get banned, flags get banned. And this kind of feeds into a, a big idea that I'll talk a bit more about, which is transcendence. So the ultimate transcendent figure in our, in our possibly our history of human culture is God. Now, I'm not here to kind of talk about the kind of religious about whether God exists or anything like that, but as a transcendent figure, the word of God is considered to be a key cultural marker for what's considered to be valuable in the world. And you don't have to get too far from the idea of a transcendent God who sits above the world and tells us how it was made, what's going to happen next, how you should live your life, before you get to people like him. Kings. So as an extension of God's power on earth, we have kings who are the people that determine what our cultu cultural values should be. So rather than thinking necessarily that these cultural values just spring up democratically out of the earth, we have figures like this who take control and take agency and tell us what forms of representation we should use. Now, this finds expression in lots of other ways, so I'll just give a few quick examples, but probably quite potent ones. We have governments who determine cultural values, what can be represented and what can't be. And I don't need to probably say too much more about this image to say what it is. Transcendent figure, um, although democratically elected, determines the form of representation that we're allowed to use to express our view of the world. And the old saying is that it doesn't take long necessarily before you, um, after burning books, before you go on to burn people. But it's not all necessarily malevolent. So let's have a look at this nice chap. So this is a patron. You might see that this guy's in an art gallery. There's some, there's some kind, of, kind of modern looking art in the background. And uh, this guy's a patron. I, I don't know his name, but he's donated some money, he's, he's been a philanthropist, he's given some money to enable these artists to make this, this work. And that seems like a, like a generous gesture, but you could also probably argue that he's extracting some type of cultural capital from doing that. So the power that's expressed in determining what forms of representation are used doesn't always necessarily need to be coercive, but the hand of power is still there. You know, representation doesn't come for free. There are consequences. There are things that people look to, to draw out from it when they bestow patronage on you. But I want to talk now about some people that wanted to kind of move away from this idea of representation and culture being controlled by transcendent figures, kings, gods. And they are the people who, a couple of hundred years ago, originated the term that's become known as the Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment was the idea that instead of kind of accepting that um, power exists in the hands of God or kings, we could apply science and reason to try and understand the world and create enlightenment. 
So enlightenment in a very literal sense is illuminating things which we don't yet understand, the things in the world that we don't yet fully grasp. They wanted to use rationality and science to try and understand the world and find new ways of representing it. But it's, it's not an uncomplicated process. I think if you look at the picture, if you look at the, the depiction of the people who are the originators of the Enlightenment, they're coming at it from a primarily white, European, privileged position. Women are there, but very much marginal. And so it hasn't been, taken too long for people to kind of question this problematic concept of, of the Enlightenment. Who's the person who's doing the enlightening? Who's the person that's deciding what things need to, need to have light shone on them? So there's, again, an entrenched privilege in this idea that those people who haven't yet seen the light or, understand, or understood what's there to be understood can be uh, enlightened. And there's a, arguably a, a pretty strong cultural arrogance to that. And Charlie Chaplin's commenting on that taking it into the 20th century, this idea that you can understand the world through rationality and science takes us to a position where our production of the world becomes instrumentalized, our rationality becomes domineering to the point where the, 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 the uniqueness of the human individual gets crushed within these highly rational scientific forces. So this, this idea that um, uh, we, can, we can illuminate the, the world and kind of make people understand the things that they haven't yet understood. It's politically problematic and Chaplin's calling attention to that. Now, I want to take it now into the territory of art and, and try and relate it a little bit to LARP, which is that in the 20th century we've had a lot of art movements that have tried to move away from this very top-down view of culture, whether it's a top-down view of culture where kings or gods determine what our cultural values are and they've tried to find new ways of, exp of expression that offer more um, randomness or, or empowerment for, for difference and plurality to emerge. So here are a couple of examples. So an image from uh, the Surrealists. So in the, in the 1920s there were the, the artistic movements of Dada and Surrealism who wanted to do things differently and find a way of getting away from the sort of the transcendent idea of an artist bestowing wisdom on the world and telling people what they should value in the way that they look at the world. The Surrealists wanted to do this in a kind of unique way. They said that the subjective position of the, of the artist and the author is a problem. The artist and the author expressing their personal view of the world means that other people don't get as much flexibility to explore their view of the world. And the way they wanted to do this was to try and get away from subjectivity and they did that with things like randomness so coupling random images together so rather than having a clear idea okay I'm gonna make this piece of artwork that's gonna express X Y and Z they just said I'm gonna to couple together some random images and then you the viewer can make your own mind up about what you see they also use things like automatic writing so you write and write and write and you don't have a clear plan about what you're gonna write your subconscious just chucks things out at you and that way you can find a form of liberation from that. In a different uh, culture you had the Situationists who were very closely associated with the sort of the revolutionary moment of Paris in May 1968. Now they took a, a slightly different view to the Surrealists. They looked at the way that art practices were happening like theatre, like the you know, statues and paintings in a gallery and they said we're in the society of the spectacle we're in a society where a cultural value, again, is being given to us by an artist. We're being told that we have to look at this and think, okay, this artist clearly knows what they're talking about when they represent the world. And they wanted to do that through a couple of um, kind of interesting w ways of, of empowering people to move away from um, spectatorship and the spectacle and finding a more active relationship to everyday life. It's similar to the idea of saying fuck passive art and pissing on statues. And they did this with things like the derive, which is, um, in, in English you might call it a drift, a, 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 an apparently aimless drift through a city, where a group of people wander through a city and just have encounters with the things that arrive at them. In some ways it's not dissimilar to the type of activity you might have in the Other Life Project. The Other Life pro Project is a form of drift where you come in with no preconceptions and things just arrive and you're affected by them. So this, this is a, 
a situationist map where they take the very regimented and constructed view of the world that a map gives you and they say, okay, no, we're going to break this apart. We're going to take this apart and re-piece it together so that we can find different pathways, gaps in reality and pass through the, the, the space that we've been given and find a new reality and a reality that's closer to everyday life. You also had movements like Fluxus. This is a Fluxus kit. So the artist George McEunis um, would, would give you a, a collection of random objects and would often give you an instruction that's kind of impossible to accomplish. So the, the invitation is to spell your name with these objects. Now, you could try and do that, like that's the correct thing to do with it, but really this is a play kit. And it's a play kit to just do whatever you want with, really, to play with some seeds, to play with a little mini umbrella, there's some powder there. The invitation is to really play with randomness. And again, it's moving away from this idea that the artist gives you a clear representation of the world that affirms some kind of cultural value. And it empowers you to take this tool toolkit and make your own reality. And I think that's in some ways similar to what we do in LARP. You know, we're, we're given some tools as players and we're invited to, to go and play and kind of make something. And it's not predetermined what we're going to make and it's not predetermined what we're going to represent. We have some affordances to create divergent and, and, a, and a plural variety of worlds through the, the tools that are given. The artist still has some control by saying these are the things that you get to play with, but we get to play with them in a, in a broad plurality of ways. So this is taking us into what we might broadly call the postmodern moment. If we think of the Enlightenment and what, what's known as modernism as being the idea that we can use science and rationality to understand what's really happening in the world and then enlighten people so they really understand what's happening. Postmodernism is saying, no, 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 let's, let's fuck that idea of there being answers that rationality can give us and question everything. So you can take the, the tools in the play kit and make your own answers and find your own plural uh, views. And that takes us into the territory of relativism. The world isn't one, the world isn't unified, the world is full of a vast variety of things. Myriad different cultures from different places with different values. And um, I'm not saying that people are vegetables and fruits, but hopefully you kind of get the idea that there is, there is diversity and divergence in contrast to the sort of modernist rational idea that we can have a unified understanding of cultural value in the world. And so this is, this is cultural particularity. This is the idea that there isn't universal culture. There isn't a culture that unifies our understanding of humanity in its entirety. There are all C, not a big C particular cultures with their own specific story, with their own specific values. And again, I think, you know, you can argue that LARP gives us this. It gives us the opportunity to bring our own perspective to something. And it also gives us the possibility of playing with roles that are very different to us. So rather than saying, okay, in the Greek theatre, there is a chorus and they can't change anything. And they're going to think pretty much one view of the world is going to be reaffirmed at the end. This pluralistic viewpoint says there's massive diversity, there's massive divergence, there's massive possibility. So you could argue that role play could be seen as a postmodern phenomenon. The idea that in contrast to an author giving you a view of the world, we as players get to make our own version of the world. And you have many artists in, in, in recent decades like Alan Capro in New York who used happenings and activities as a way for people to kind of playfully engage with the world around them and make their own story and make their own reality. A key part of that is that by moving away from the transcendent power and sovereignty of the author, we're offering or hoping to offer more agency to the players to create their own meaning um, and create subcultures, pluralistic subcultures that are free from the domineering institutionalization of scientific rationality. But at this point, I'm going to say there's a downside to all of this. For me, the downside of postmodernism, and, and I will try to ultimately relate this back to art, is the idea that you can believe anything. If there's no rationality, if there's no sense of common values and standards, it means that you, 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 and you can all have completely different versions of the world. I can say 2 plus 2 is 4, you can say 2 plus 2 is 5, and we're both right. 
Now, some people might think that's a good thing. I'd say that there's some problems with the idea of believing anything. Believing anything means that you sanction lying. It means that you sanction the idea that the Holocaust didn't happen. In postmodern culture, it's completely fine to say that because you get to believe whatever you want. I think that's a problem. And I think with the, also with the, the celebration of cultural particularity, it means that we can all have our different views of the world, we can all have our different cultural values. And if that's the thing that we celebrate above all else, then we start to have very conflicting and contrasting views of the world with no real desire or need to try and bring them in any way together. Now, again, some people might argue that that's okay, but for me, I think, if there's someone that I don't know, do I like to go and try to know more? Or do I like to move further and further and further away from them? And for me, it's the former. Also, representation is problematic because in the postmodern uh, idea of the world, the representational forms that we use to express how we see the world, like words, like co concrete images, are rejected because you know, they quite rightly argue that words are something that's constructed by people in positions of power. Someone in a position of power gave me a set of words that weren't of my choosing. So let's fuck words and find different ways of expressing ourselves. That's empowering to a certain extent, but also what happens when we don't have a language that we can understand each other with. If we're all inventing our own language, then how can we ever know what other people are thinking and feeling? We go further and further away, and we have a world that looks like this. Within these facets, we have myriad cultural particulars, and they all get to be as beautiful and as rarefied and as clear in their own little sphere. But if I'm there, I can't know you there. And ironically, if you look at an image like this, it creates this sense that actually, in this postmodern moment, are we really celebrating diversity and plurality? Or actually, does it just look like a mishmash where nothing's understandable? That's an open question, but you can probably tell which way I lean on it. <laughs> and also, postmodernism has its illusions. In this pick and mix culture, we get to think, okay, I can be anything. I can, I can have a bit of this and a bit of that. I can reimagine myself. I can reimagine my identity. I can reimagine new representations of the world every single day. But within that, perhaps we also have the illusion of choice, the illusion of heterogeneity, when actually everything we're eating is still candy mm -hmm. and everything that we're buying is still being bought within a structure that affirms the idea of buying candy. So you can have the illusion of choice within actually a system that's quite totalizing. And you need to look no further than that to know that. On this image, you can go anywhere. You can do anything. You can be anyone. You can tell any version of the world that you want, but you're still working within a molar dominating structure that uses that productive pluralistic participation for quite a singular purpose. And in this case, it's capital. So where does this leave LARP? We've got an image here of a guy looking at some kind of spherical object, like a, like a little miniature world. In fact, this is the first image of a LARP in the whole presentation, which I, I'm kind of glad to have got to this point. Um, so LARP in the postmodern moment, where does LARP stand in all this? You know, is, is LARP looking for, you know, the, the celebration of vast plurality and difference? I think it is. I think we're looking to do that. We're looking to tell stories from lots of places, which is great. But is also LARP looking to kind of create a sense of connection and commonality between people? I think it's also trying to do that. So there's some kind of paradoxes here. And, and where do we sit in the middle with that? I don't have any single answer, and I don't think any LARP can have any single answer. There are such a vast variety of different ways of making LARP and playing LARP. I think there are many answers. But I think in an increasingly fragmented world, it's worth thinking about this. Are we celebrating divergence? Yeah. But is it still possible to celebrate commonality and connection? I hope it is. So the, the champion that I have for, for my project of kind of combining this plurality and commonality is this chap, Barak Spinoza. He's a Dutch philosopher from the late 18th century. And he had a theory which he called the common. 
and I'll try and summarize it really briefly, but his idea basically was, was to say, okay, we're all, we're all individuals. We're all coming at the world from very singular points of view. My sense of cultural value in the world is very different to yours. So we have singularities, we have difference. But he, he talked about the idea that it would be possible if we can get away from the transcendent figure of God controlling everything and kings controlling everything, for us to find spaces where we could coordinate desires, where I could come to understand your desire and you could understand mine. And that endeavor of an intersubjective exchange where I engage with your subjectivity and vice versa puts us in a position where we stop looking at the world purely for its use value. We stop looking for what's useful for me. I take what I need. And because I've understood what you need, I start to look for things that are useful as exchange value. And when we start to get to that point of exchange value, that's where we have the common. And the common is essentially the idea that we can create temporary spaces for engaging with difference, coordinating difference, and finding some common value and common need, but only temporarily, constantly being revised, constantly being reassessed. So I want to think about what LARP does well because it does do things brilliantly well and in, in talking about this I'm going to draw quite heavily, that's the common, cheesy, cheesy image of the common. Hard to achieve but I think possible to achieve. I'm going to draw really heavily on, on uh, some of the stuff that Jakub Stenros talked about in his, um, his presentation at Salmokata last year. He talked about the aesthetics of LARP and I thought he talked brilliantly about some things that are really valuable about LARP. We have co-creation and we have inter-immersion. So in the same way that Spinoza talks about intersubjective exchange, recognizing what you bring and recognizing what I bring, the co-creative practices of LARP give us a direct opportunity to make that exchange. I endow you with the role that's going to allow us to play this thing. You endow me with the role that's allow, going to allow me to play this thing. And I recognize your view and I hope you recognize mine. It's also embodied the fact that we're using all of our senses, we're, with the fact that we're alive to abstract, literal representations, spoken words, written language. Our body is in the world in LARP in a way it isn't in other forms, and we absorb information through the senses that tells us a lot. And I think that's a key difference with other forms of art. But crucially, it's emergent. You know, for me, in, in the exciting thing about LARP design is it doesn't have to have a beginning, middle, of an end. It doesn't have to have some kind of fatalistic determination that the hero is going to die tragically and I'm going to purge my feelings of rebelliousness by being warned by this story, as is the case with the Greek plays. We have an emergent narrative where we collectively can make anything happen and perhaps almost anything happen. But there are a couple of things that I think we could maybe think about doing slightly differently. And... Um, I'm going to kind of respond again to Yaku's call to make a little mini manifesto. So here's my mini manifesto. First of all, Habitus. Terrible slide, but it's good because it's got the name of the guy who came up with this idea. A guy called Pierre Bourdieu talked about Habitus, which is essentially the social capital that we all bring to a certain field of experience. We all come to Knutpunkt with our own experiences, with our own education, with our own social and cultural background. As LARP designers, we often think, okay, I really want to make a LARP about this. You, general people, come and be interested in, I don't know, a LARP about China. But I don't know if you're actually interested in that. So I'm interested in the possibility that I, as a designer, might do it the other way around and go to you and try and talk to you about what you're interested in, individually and as a group, and try and design from that. Now, that is a clear difficulty that that's going to take a lot of time. But I think that's time that's probably worth spending. I'm going to try to spend it. I also want to talk about dissensus. Now, if I'm going to design something that's made up of your desires, they're not going to be the same. And that's a good thing. Sometimes I have the feeling that within the LARP community, possibly due to the fact that we have certain commonalities in our backgrounds, you know, we're probably you know, relatively well-educated, relatively... Um, well, actually, I'm not going to make any more generalizations about that, about what connects us. But we have differences. And I'm interested in the possibility that rather than trying to create a design that rhetorically reaffirms a quite liberal left-wing worldview, you know, my worldview, I want to make LARPs that invite people to kind of get into a productive clash. 
where we can have dissensual play that actually maybe really gets into the fact that we might really, really not agree with each other. And if we're thinking about taking LARPs out into the world, into big corporations and big companies, let's engage with people that we really don't agree with and let them play their view of the world and then see whether they like it if it goes to its extremes. The other thing, finally, is documentation. Now, I think, you know, we look at lots of pictures of LARPs and I think, where do those pictures come from? Who's making them? My worry sometimes is that the documentation comes too much from the organizer and the designer. They express their agency in documenting their LARP in the way that they want to make it look good for their purposes. What happens if we start to put the, the tools of documentation in the people who played the thing? So that your agency isn't just expressed when you play, it's also expressed in the way that you narrativize and remember and historicize the LARP. That already happens online, on Facebook, we talk about what happened, we write our epilogues, we tell our stories. But I still think we could do that better. And I'm not saying that we want to necessarily put cameras in everybody's hands so they can take pictures of everything, because if there's one thing that I feel quite strongly is that pictorial representations don't tell the story of what I experience as a player in the LARP. That's a form of representation that cr creates a fiction of what my experience was. A photograph can't tell what I felt. But possibly I can write what I felt if I'm given the opportunity to do so, if I'm invited to. Can I contribute to telling the collective story of what we did together? And I think that's not just valuable for our own sake in terms of debriefing, but if we're looking to take the story of LARP as an art form out into the world, then these dialogues of documentation, I think, could be valuable. So I'm going to finish by talking a bit about why culture matters. We all come from different cultures, and those differences need to be recognized. I think, you know, Magnar's touched upon this in, in his talk, you know, he recognized that the, the plurality and the diversity of, of the communities, plural, that come together in these places is something that should really be celebrated. What an opportunity for people like me and all of us to go to these different places and meet all these amazing people. What an opportunity. So we want to recognize those differences. And within those differences, there's also an opportunity to really engage in a productive clash of, of seeing. It's not just the touchy-feely part of difference of like, oh, how cool that you're from another country. I've never been there. Tell me all about it. Da, da, da. What do you believe that I really, really don't agree with? And let's, let's have a good go at that. Now, that feels like it's a violent gesture, but I want to strongly argue that it can be a productive gesture if it's looking to engage with difference, but also recognize the possibility for commonality. You know, Martin Nielsen talked inspiringly at the LARP Oratory about building bridges in a world when people are putting walls up. And that's why I think this cultural stuff's important. If we don't have a common ground from which to build bridges, if me and my group don't have a solid basis from which to build a bridge, the bridge isn't going to get built. If we spill out into these myriad islands of cultural difference, then we're going to have to build a lot of bridges, and it's going to be a lot harder to create the kind of connectivity in the world that we represented in that last slide. So if we're thinking about culture and the forms of representation that we use to create culture, and the types of social space that we use to affirm and align our cultures. We want to celebrate difference, but we also really want to look for that, that connectivity and that collective. And I think the collective storytelling that we make, not just in our play, but also the collective storytelling that we make retrospectively about our play, is a key part of building a bridge and taking LARP as an art form out into the rest of the world. That's all I have. Thank you.